A while ago, Games Master celebrated their 250th issue by listing their 250 favourite gaming moments. Whilst the top moment was obvious to anyone with a passing knowledge of Games Master's biases, it nevertheless sparked a little conversation between myself and my good buddy Ryuichi Hasegawa. Inevitably, it culminated in us sharing our personal top 5 gaming moments. Now, what I found fascinating was just how different our respective lists turned out to be. Whilst I focused more on the moments in games, his list focused on the experience of playing games. So, just for a bit of fun, here are two lists. My top 5 gaming experiences and my top 5 gaming moments. Overhearing a conversation between two unlikely gamers. I'd just like to kick off by saying that I wasn't eavesdropping, they were just quite loud. Anywho, uh, some years ago I was on a train home, and in the seats in front of me were two guys who were... I suppose the best way of saying it would be the stereotypical console Call of Duty player. You know, they're all, oh my, this, and ah oh, bruv, that. One was attempting to tell the other about this awesome game that he was playing. To be honest, it was slightly painful hearing how unable he was to either articulate why the game was good, or in fact string a coherent sentence together. But the reason I remember it is because of the game. mainstream acceptance for the win? Playing hologram time traveller in an airport in Florida. Way back when I went on holiday to Florida. I was young, dumb, well, dumber, and initially upset that we weren't going to the Isle of Wight. I mean, Disneyland had nothing on Black Kang Chine, let me tell you. Uh, anyway, at the airport, I can't remember if we were coming or going. Um, probably coming, I think. Um, anyway, there was this white domed arcade machine thing that promised 3D holographic gaming. What I got was an unresponsive FMV mess that ate my money. I think this may be where my impassioned hatred of 3D began. The first time I played my Dreamcast. Now, primarily due to a severe lack of funds, I mean, hey, this stuff is expensive, I'd usually show up late to the gaming party. All that changed in around 1999. Uh, during that time, I saved up every penny that I could lay my hands on, and I bought the brand spanking new Dreamcast and a copy of Sonic Adventure. This represents the first and indeed only time that I showed up at the start of something big. Um, true, in this instance, that big was the president of Sega having half a dozen simultaneous heart attacks and the company nearly going bankrupt with, you know, details. Suffice it to say, the first time I powered up this next-gen bad boy, oh, it was love at first sight, and to this day, the Dreamcast is still the best console I have ever had. Playing Prop Cycle in the Arcade the things arcades will always have that home gaming won't are gimmicky arcade cabinets. And I've always regretted never getting a chance to play Afterburner at the arcade. I mean, Christ, that would have been awesome. But one thing I'm a complete sucker for is ridiculous gimmicky arcade cabinets. And Prop Cycle was ridiculous. You sit on a bike and you pedal in order to make an on-screen contraption fly. Um, there's a photo of me looking manic that is currently under armed guard somewhere. Twisty! But trust me when I say that it was a great, if surreal, experience. Basically any light gun game ever. Is there anything more entertaining than pointing a plastic, colourful facsimile of a deadly weapon at a screen and mashing that trigger until blisters form? No, I didn't think so. A particular favourite of mine is House of the Dead and the House of the Dead series in general. I mean, I always play a little metagame with those sorts of... Uh, games. Uh, it's not accuracy that I care about, nor score for that matter, but how many bullets I've fired in any given mission. Uh, after a normal session, even John Woo would think, steady on, that's a bit excessive. The best at-home light gun that I ever fired in anger though was probably the SNES Super Scope. 
Uh, it never seemed to work properly, but god damn, it was an awesome sight to be old. StarCraft, the battle on the Amarego cinematic. Blizzard's cinematic department is quite literally second to none. Whatever I might think about their current direction, and uh, fuck you, always online, I will not hear a word said against their cinematics team. Uh, their most recent of uh, pre-rendered efforts have, in my view, been better than cinema quality. So, when I say that this is the best cinematic, not only in StarCraft, but in any Blizzard game ever, well, I hope you realise that I do not say that lightly. Coming about halfway through the Zerg campaign, this is a masterclass in how to create a suspenseful, action-packed sequence. When I saw it for the first time, 13 years ago I think it was now, it was a true fuck yeah moment, before fuck yeah became a meme. Painkiller, the first boss. Painkiller is a ridiculous game. Uh, for some reason, I imagine the design process going something like, uh, Hey, wouldn't it be cool to shoot evil monks and ninjas and zombie World War One soldiers? Yeah, let's do it. Although, obviously in Polish. Uh, it's an insane slice of pure, shooty goodness. Uh, no cover mechanics, or regenerating health, or physics puzzles, or any of that other extraneous crap. But when I hit that first boss... <clears throat> my jaw dropped. It, and it takes quite a bit for that to happen, especially in games. I um, think I've become far too cynical in my old age. I spot this thing in the distance, and it's massive, and I nearly shatter brick. The only thing that could beat this boss for sheer scale and impressiveness, as far as I can see, would be a, a G1 Transformers game where you've got to beat up Unicron using Bumblebee. Mass Effect. The Fifth Fleet saves the day. After 30 hours of fighting against overwhelming odds and massive condescension from the Council, I get to stand by and watch the Citadel fleet get royally banged up by Sovereign and the Geth. A strong part of me thought, ha <laughs> ha, serves those bastards right, don't they know that, as the player character, I'm always right? But then a message comes through from Joker. One word from Femship and Lance Henriksen arrives with the entire Arcturus fleet and humanity gets to be a little bit badass and save the day. Yeah, it is. Cheesy as all hell. But then again, so was a fair amount of the game leading up to that point. For me, it worked brilliantly and gave us the sort of meaningful space battle that was utterly absent from the Star Wars prequels. Yes, I'm still bitter. Vampire The Masquerade Bloodlines The opening of the Fun with Pestilence quest Bloodlines is one of the best written, best voice acted games I have ever played. Uh, in fact, the only ones that come close in quality are the Legacy of Kane games as far as I'm concerned. However, with Bloodlines, nowhere is this quality more evident than in the Fun with Pestilence quest. There's a disease tearing through downtown LA, prompting CDC to start nosing around. Vampires may be immune, but kind ain't, and it won't take long until someone who's seen too many movies puts two and two together. Our first lead takes us to the apartment of a ghoul named Paul. Paul's dead, but there's a message from Hannah, his sort of girlfriend. She's sick in bed, but she has the information that we need to end this now. Easing her passing, reassuring her, making her last few moments as emotionally bearable as possible. It is a beautiful, beautiful scene that has even more power and punch when playing as an Arcavian. Aliens vs Predator Marine Campaign The First Encounter with a Xenomorph If there's one thing that this game does astoundingly well, it's create atmosphere. Everything feels right, uh, the click beep of the motion tracker, the sounds of the doors and equipment all around you, uh, the noise your pulse rifle makes when you unleash short controlled bursts of 10mm explosive tipped caseless. 
By the time you reach the crashed space jockey ship exterior, your nerves are already on edge. You go up a lift and are momentarily blinded as you realize you forgot to switch off your image intensifier. You flick it off and the motion track immediately starts to bleep at you, but the lit blinking lights all around make it difficult to see a goddamn thing. There's a hiss of steam and the screeching growl of his head and trying to eat your face. You back away, firing your pulse rifle in blind panic. All your training and composure gone right out the window. You just hoping you're hitting something. I you see its twitching corpse laying on the ground, monomolecular acid hissing as the body dissolves. You hadn't noticed, but you'd screamed in terror, and the people in the next room are asking if you're okay. Okay? I may never be okay again. I'm not too